So now we're going to have Brielle Corey and Marissa Gross and their presentation on the stream bake restoration and the JMU farm landscape design and view shed protection. Good afternoon. I'm Brielle Corey. And I'm Marissa Gross. And our advisor for this project was Dr. Carol Nash. So to give you a little background on why Marissa and I are interested in this project, we're both ISAP majors concentrating in the environment sector. For the last year, I've been employed by BioNovo, working with natural swimming pools. And in August, I will attend the University of Colorado to get my Master's of the Environment. And for the past two years, I've been working at um, a gardens back home in New York. And uh, when we heard this project from Dr. Nash, Brianna and I both had similar backgrounds and similar interests, so we were really excited about it. So some history on the farm. So it was built in 1840 and has been uni universally owned since 1929. The Hook family used to live on the property and actually farmed the land for their own uses. And now the property is intended for academic and recreational purposes, such as classes, research projects, meetings, or like picnics. Um, the farm is in, in total 31 acres, and it's made up of 25 acres of planted forest five acres of mowed lawn, and one acre of riparian hardwood forest. And the North River runs adjacent to the property, as you can see in the lower left-hand corner of this picture. And this is just another map of the location of the farm. Um, so it's located on Alumni Drive, which is right off of Fort Republic Road. And it's about 13 miles east of Jamie's campus. And you can see its relation to Harrisonburg, and you just go straight to the Fort Republic to get there. Um, so the project consisted of eight students with four different subgroups within it. And all the projects focused on stream bank restoration, just different aspects of it. Um, so one subgroup worked on the soil testing of the bank and performed various soil tests, including a bank erosion hazard index, or a BEHI. And another group focused on 3D modeling um, of the bank in order to get a better visual, better visual and be able to see the damage that has accumulated over the years. And then there was a media project, which encompassed making a web page for the JMU farm and getting the farm out there. And finally, our project, which focused on landscape design and view shed protection. And all of the groups worked together in order to tackle the issue of bank stabilization. And there has also been various other projects um, completed on the farm in previous years. In 2013, a project was done <coughs> on native gardening, where a garden of native species was planted in the forest <coughs> on the property. And in also in 2013, two students quantified the riparian buffer conditions. And then this past December, um, students uh, modeled a boat ramp in to be put on the farm. Each of this year's projects centered around the street make up the farm due to its current conditions. <coughs> this was the riparian buffer at the farm in 1937. Even with the complete buffer, the Hook House always preserved the historic view of the North River. Very little of this riparian buffer remains today due to lack of maintenance and intense flooding events. A significant force of erosion on the stream bank is coming from the North River itself. The depth of the river changes due to varying levels of precipitation, weathering, and away any loose soil. Here we can see the water level of the river at the bottom of the bank. As you can see, the middle portion of the bank has been steadily washed away with very little vegetation rooting the soil. Although JMU does not keep any livestock at the farm, the area has been degraded by cattle on the adjoining farm. Along with soil displacement, cattle introduce excess nutrients and fecal coliform bacteria to our waterways. Here you see where the farm's western neighbor allows their livestock access into the river. The little vegetation that remains on the stream bank is not in good condition. Intricate root systems that once held the soil in place are now doing the opposite. The heavier tree's weight pulls on its roots, cleaving chunks of soil from the bank. All of this year's capstone projects at the farm concluded that stream bank erosion is a major issue. Um, so our main problem was creating a native landscape that didn't block the viewhead of the historic cookhouse. But we also had other factors that we had to think about as well. 
So we wanted to create a landscape that was aesthetically pleasing, but also one that was sustainable and supportive of the stream bank and helped reduce erosion. And the main aspect that we focused on was protecting the view shed of the house. And as we've mentioned, the Hook House is, has a very historic value to it. So we just wanted to make sure that none of the species we picked um, lock that view shed. And then we also specifically only wanted to use native species. And that's because all of, they have a, a significant amount of benefits, including being able to adapt to local environments. They save a lot of money and time. Um, they also have many wild, wildlife species benefit from them, including birds and butterflies. And we also wanted to improve the overall health of the river, since the river is rated as impaired. So our first thought to address this problem was to establish a riparian buffer. A riparian buffer is the land adjacent to streams where vegetation is affected by the aquatic environment. Ranging from 25 to 100 feet wide, buffers increase water quality, filter pollutants, and reduce the effects of erosion. A few key problems arose when exploring the idea of implementing a riparian buffer. Although there's room to plant a buffer more than 25 feet wide, doing so would completely block the historic view of the North River. Also, implementing a riparian buffer would be quite a large scale project, with a thousand feet of stream bank needing to be planted. So we needed to scale back. If we could demonstrate the necessity and feasibility of restoration on the farm, we would support future projects to repair the stream bank. We merged all of our competing interests and decided to design and plant a sample stream bank landscape. On a small selected spot, we would plant native herbaceous species that complemented the view shed of the hook house, while also countering the effects of erosion. This sample landscape serves as a small scale model for future restorations of the farm. So a feasible solution that we came up with was a native sustainable landscape. And a native sustainable landscape is a stable and productive ecosystem that conserves the physical and biological processes occurring on that landscape. And also a designed and managed sustainable landscape can maintain hydrological function, increase plant and animal diversity, increase soil integrity, and contribute to the overall human wellness. So some importance of uh, sustainable landscapes. Um, for economic advantage, having a sustainable landscape can increase property value overall just by um, having a nicer appearance and having a positive impact on the land to just increase the value um, as a whole. And it's also aesthetically pleasing and is more appealing to visitors and will attract more people. And one of the goals of this project was to try and get the farm out in the community and get it more known. And having an aesthetically pleasing landscape will really help do that. It will also improve the ecosystem by increasing biodiversity positively and impacting the soil and the area around it. And it will also provide support to the stream bank with root depth and erosion control. View shed is the natural environment visible from a viewing point, but it encompasses a larger context than just the line of sight. View shed is your total frame of vision, including your periphery. View sheds are recognized as an important factor in historic context. Here is the hook house in relation to the North River. Maintaining the historic view shed on the farm is one of our largest considerations after being educated on the hook family. The hook house is oriented so the front of their home faces the river. The family was heavily invested in the Shenandoah Canal Company and would have watched boats ferrying farm goods from Mount Crawford down the river. After appreciating the importance of this historic view shed, we needed to select plants that would enhance it. We decided that plants in the sample landscape should have deep roots to anchor the soil and also have a shorter mature height to preserve the view of the North River. So these are some of the methods we took throughout our process. We wanted to get a full understanding of the problem and the aspects behind it. So we did extensive background research on landscape design and the different techniques and methodologies used um, previously. And we also did research on view shed protection and just to get ideas of how it's been done in the past on different historic <coughs> properties. So 
In order for us to visualize um, the landscape we had in mind, we used a program called Real-Time Landscaping Pro. And this um, software was able to, we were able to make a model of the landscape so that we could just visualize everything. And then we moved on to plant selection and choosing all the native species that we wanted to and doing extensive research on all different plants and their mature height and a bunch of different characteristics that um, would benefit the area. Then we had a charrette with all the other groups where every gr all the groups came together and presented their ideas to each other in order for us to all be on the same page and pick a focal point and get all of our ideas together to tackle the issue that we all have at hand. Then we had a meeting with Jan Mahone, who's the director at the Edith Carrier Arboretum. And she gave us a lot of beneficial information. She helped us with different plant species and different techniques on landscaping. Um, and the meeting was really helpful and gave us a lot of different perspectives on the issue. And then this past week, we had a meeting with the provost office and facilities management. Um, they have a very high interest in the property, so we were presenting, every group presented their ideas and all the work we've done in the past two years to them, and they were all really excited about it. So our meeting with Jan, in the beginning of February, we took a trip to um, the Arboretum, and we sat down with Jan and went over our project and all the information about the farm and all the ideas we had for it. And we showed her a copy of our suggested plant list and all the different models we produced. And she really gave us beneficial information. She gave us suggestions on species that we should be using, species that we shouldn't be using. She told us that we shouldn't be planting blueberries when we were going to, so that was really helpful. And she also gave us some techniques to use, such as layering and using ground covers. And she showed us a lot of different resources, such as the plants that they use at the Arboretum. And then she also introduced us to this book, which Dr. Nash was able to get for us, and we were able to use it in our project. And overall, Jane gave us some really good insight and gave us a different perspective, which was really helpful in our process. So Real-Time Landscaping Pro, this was the software that I had mentioned that we used to produce um, a model of the landscapes. So what we did was we went out to the farm many times to take a bunch of different pictures at different perspectives and different zooms. And then in the software, you can import a background photo. And on that background photo, you can import um, from a list of 100 different species. Um, you could import those species onto the background picture and make a landscape. And you can kind of see right here how like, before the house um, had no plants on it, but now here there's a bunch of different species that they're able to visualize what their home would look like before they actually went out and did it, and that's exactly <coughs> what we did at the farm. And one of the, one of a, a cool tool that the program had was a future growth model, so we were able to actually show how the plants would look in 20 years so that we could ensure that the view shed would be protected and the mature height wouldn't get too high. <coughs> Um, so some challenges we had with the software. So when Dr. Nash had first gotten us the software, we didn't realize that it could only be used on Windows machines. So we had to try and find, and Brianna and I both have Macs, so we had to try and find a laptop that this software could be downloaded on. And luckily the IT department in the College of Integrated Science and Engineering was able to lend us a laptop for the past year that we were able to use. Um, and then we also had trouble capturing the perfect photo. So it was really hard to just get the right zoom and the right angle just so that all the plants would look perfect on the picture. And then we also had difficulty navigating the software and just learning how um, all the different features were, worked. And we knew there were all these cool features on it, but we weren't exactly sure how to use them. But we eventually got there. And then we also had trouble finding all the plants we wanted. So even though there's a list of over 100 species, not every native species to our area was on there. So we kind of had to improvise and use a different type of species, but it had the sim similar characteristics and same um, height that we were looking for. In collaboration with the entire team at the, at the JMU farm, we narrowed down locations for our sample landscape. 
We plan to plant in the riparian area directly bordering the bank, not on the bank itself. Much of the stream bank drops off steeply, so we looked for a spot on the bank with a slope of less than 50 degrees. A smaller slope of the bank suggests the soil is more stable, which would help preserve our native landscape. We would also support the bank with plant species that have deep root depths. We looked for a location that roots between 6 to 12 inches long and a location that those roots would survive best in. Lastly, we wanted a plot that highlighted the importance of the historic view shed while preserving its integrity. The three areas Marissa and I narrowed down are indicated here. For the first location, we have the western border of the forest. The second is a location where there was a proposed boat ramp in a previous capstone. And the third location is south of the hook house in the direct line of sight. Using Real-Time Landscaping Pro, we modeled our landscape for each of the three sites. For the western border of the forest, the right image displays how our landscape would look immediately after planting, when the species are from around one to two years old. On the left is a software simulation of how the plant life would fully develop after 20 years. Our second site is located where a previous capstone proposed a boat ramp. In this section of the stream bank, the earth has been eroded by human entrance into the North River. We modeled our native landscape lining each side of this depression. Our third site is south of the Hook House in the direct line of sight. This location is the most critical regarding viewshed protection because planting here with tall heights would directly block the view of the North River. In this model of the mature growth, you'll notice that there are no trees. We're not looking at arboreal species to protect the areas along the stream bank, but are focusing on smaller species, including shrubs, to pay respect to this viewshed. So for selecting plants, we used a number of resources, but the one we used the most was um, the Native Plant Finder with the Virginia Department of <coughs> Conservation and Recreation. And this is what our search box looked like. So we specifically wanted the region Mountain and Piedmont. And then for the uses of the plant, the species, we wanted wildlife, horticulture, and conservation. And for light, we wanted partial sun and full sun. And then max height, we chose 15 feet. Um, we tried to stay more under 15 feet and more at 10, but in order to get maximize our results, we chose 15. And then we specifically wanted riparian buffer, buffer species. So when we would search this, we would get a ton of results back. So we had to go through all the plants and research all of them. And we were looking for specific characteristics, um, such as total height, root depth, shade and sun tolerant, native to Piedmont Mountain region, and increased biodiversity in the area. And from that, we created an Excel spreadsheet with all the species. And this is more of a condensed version of that Excel spreadsheet. but on the, Excel, on the spreadsheet, we also researched max height, required moisture, required light, the spread, bloom time, what wildlife they attract, attract, and any other important notes that we found while researching. So with some of these plants, um, like the wildflowers, which are the woodland sunflower, the brown-eyed Susan, um, bee, bee balm, butterfly weed, um, and ar aromatic aster, um, they all will increase bi biodiversity and um, help like get more butterflies and just make it more aesthetically pleasing out there. And then other plants like switchgrass and um, the ferns, they, um, specifically switchgrass, they, it's um, very well known for bank stabilization and to be put along stream banks. So that one was one we really focused on, and actually other groups that have worked at the farm really wanted to put switchgrass out there, so we were really excited to put that one on the list. Each subgroup at the farm worked independently, so gathering for an overall meeting kept us all on the same page. We presented our challenges and worked out solutions, combining collective knowledge from the farm. At the Charette, we selected our planting site out of the three that we've shown you, and found that every subgroup chose the same area to focus on, indicating how bad that area needed restoration. We selected our third site option because of its available planting area and the desperate need for erosion control. 
Also, at this site, we would be able to demonstrate how to protect the view shed of the hook house because of its direct line of sight. Um, so this was our final model that we produced, and the species that we had just put in here were switchgrass, royal fern, sunflower, and butterfly weed. So switchgrass is closest to the stream bank, and as I mentioned, it's a species best known for bank stabilization, and it has a minimum root depth of 12 inches, so that's really ideal. And putting it next to the stream bank, um, we thought would be the most beneficial because it is so impactful on the stabilization of the bank. And then we also decided to plant some ferns because overall they are really good species for controlling erosion and stabilizing soils. And they are also, they have a very low mature height. Um, I believe the royal fern has a mature height of about three feet. And um, we felt the royal fern was one of the stronger species of ferns that would survive um, the most at, in our environment. And then the woodland sunflower and butterfly weed, um, they're not only aesthetically pleasing, <coughs> but they will also help increase biodiversity. And also with the um, perennial wildflowers, when they regrow after another year, they're going to grow on top of their old roots, so their root depth will just continue to grow more and more. So that's really beneficial as well. Recently, we were able to meet with JME Facilities Management, the Provost Office, and all of the current projects at the farm. We discussed our progress and where we're headed with our native landscape. Our capstone was well received, and we hope it can make an impact at the future of the farm. So some of the future steps and recommendations we have for the farm was that we really hope to get out there, and we um, haven't gotten out, been able to get out there and plant yet, but we do hope to get out there within the next couple weeks. Um, even though the presentation's over, we do hope to still continue to work out there. Um, and it, it will also be needed to have continued maintenance once the landscape is planted, because in order to ensure the um, landscape is sustainable and beneficial to the area, it's important to keep it maintained. Um, also, we were out there just this past um, week, and we saw that there's construction on the amphitheater and on the hook house, so that was really exciting to see. And, see all the progress that's been done out there. And when we, were re when we went out there, we saw um, a future project for native planting along the pathway to the amphitheater, which is in the top picture. Um, we thought it'd be really cool to kind of incorporate a lot of our um, aspects into a new project with a different twist on it. Questions? Yeah, Josh. So you guys talked to Jan McLean about ground cover. Um, mm -hmm. Did she cite any cover crops specifically? That you guys cover produce? crops? Yeah. Um, as in would produce vegetation for consumption? Yeah, so it'd be something that like they would have paired with the species you used? That's an interesting idea. I think we only focused on um, species that were specifically native to the area, okay. um, but I mean, growing crops on the farm, that's what it was originally used for by the Hook family, so that would be something really interesting to explore. your biggest challenge in completing the project? Um, personally, my biggest challenge was dealing with the software, Real-Time Landscaping Pro. Um, it's a recent software. It was developed in 2016. Um, but first of all, transitioning from using a Mac to a PC was uh, difficult in itself. And then the software is not user-friendly for my standards, but um, it produced great results. So I'm glad we passed the learning curve. Would you go back to your model, the final model that you came up with? So you're modeling just four plants there. Mm -hmm. But would you see, I mean, it, when I look at this, like 20, when I see this 20 years out, there's going to be a lot of reseeding. So it's not just those individual plants that are going to grow yeah. up, in, but there's going to be more of, um, I think you, you would want to say that this is going to really develop uh, more robustly. But are there other things that you would want to include in that as well? Um, yeah, there's definitely other like plants that I think we would want to, not just these four species, yeah. we would want to make a diverse um, species out there. 
Um, that was just kind of one of the downfalls of the software. With so many plants, it's hard to search and figure out which ones have the same characteristics. Um, like for example, that sunflower isn't exactly a woodland sunflower, right. it's just another right. type of sunflower. Right. Um, so that was a downfall of the software that we were kind of limited to figuring out what plants we could put out there, but we definitely would put way more, like we had a list of like 18 plants, so right. we would want to put way more than just four out there. Yeah. And also another downfall that I saw was the plants only grow up, it's not like they're growing out, right. and obviously plants like bloom out more than just up, so it's hard to visualize that as well. And for the reseeding, um, we did leave this pathway clear, so as you know, the foliage starts to spread into the middle, the view shed will still be protected from the river. Mm -hmm. One of the things we don't know yet about the farm is what kind of ornamental plantings used to be there. As you'd noted in your 1930, with the 1937 aerial, the, there was definitely an opening in those trees, right? Mm -hmm. And we're assuming that that has historic value. We're assuming that that was always there, which it probably was. <coughs> uh, but one would anticipate that there were, that that front lawn area, which is so large, yeah. must have had ornamentals in it. There must have been gardens out front of the house. That was just the way things were done in the 19th century. So one thing that I would be really excited about for using this software would be to pull back to the house and start to envision what yeah. other gardens and other plantings would have looked like. Absolutely. We know, for example, from the deed from 1929 when the property sold to the university that there was an orchard out there somewhere. We've looked at the 1937 aerial photograph and there's no orchard. Mm. And so one of our, we are assuming that it's probably back behind the house. That would make sense. But it is interesting that it's very hard to capture that kind of information. So when we do this kind of work as part of a restoration, it really brings back much more of the context of what this place used to be like. Yeah. So hopefully this will serve as a model to plant the rest of the farm. It is a total of 30 or 31 acres. Um, so there's plenty of room for growth there. Five open now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have extra time. We don't want to start until